And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. Yo, Lord willing, Jeff Canarsi, Mob Talk Radio, check it out. Yo, we stay quiet, like Russell Buffalino, when things will get ugly like Pessy's death in Casino. Who do we know? No one, nobody. But we're all well respected like Della Croce and Gotti. I know wild nights, a fan and not turn. Light up a cigar and watch your spot burn. You'll get patty whacked, I'm tough like Irish dock workers. Rubber guys, rubber guys, hooligans and black lurkers. Corner berserkers, street savvy soldiers. You owe, you better pay. Don't make me say I told you. Cold you don't betray, I say what I mean. Providence in Brooklyn all the way to the bean. I'd rather be unseen like Benny the Chin. I don't gotta go to Vegas to see cities of sin. Pull the pin, drop bombs like Danny Green I write homicide like the murder machine Lansky Luciano, mastermind the racket Up in the clam house with a million in my jacket Move around when the... And welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Canarsi. We got a big one this week. We're going to talk Q&A, large Q&A. And we're going to talk about Charlie Benaggio, who was the boss of the Kansas City Mafia for 20 plus years. Probably relatively unknown. Uh, it seems like... You know, the John Gotti's of the world, Joey Merlino's of the world, they seem to get a lot of headlines, uh, Al Capone, etc. But sometimes the lesser known guys uh, really have an extraordinary life. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, But I have to apologize. I have not been able to get back to a lot of people. Uh, Just looking at the numbers, uh, I had over 400 messages uh, questions submitted this week. It was like 70 over on Facebook, another fucking 100 on the fucking Twitter, and another 100 on fucking... It's just, it's ridiculous. I can't keep up with the volume. So if I don't get to your question, it's because I can only do but so many per week. Uh, and we're going to recycle a lot of the questions back into the mailbox. Uh, so what's going on other than that? Uh, first of all, next week, we are going to take a week off. It's my birthday, so I don't like to work on my birthday. I need a break. Uh, so after this week's show, we're going to take a week off and then we'll come back, uh, with an all new show. Obviously we'll cover JFK and a lot of the other things that we've talked about. The Detroit show is finished. I am going to put that out at some point. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the Flanagans for just a a brief few minutes. Uh, it's all systems go. Uh, the cast is sort of, uh, taking place at this point. Uh, we've got the cinematographer now. Uh, We are scheduled to begin production, I believe, in the last weekend in September. We are going to be shooting in Queens, obviously, and in South Philadelphia. Uh, The story is really good. We really like where this is headed. Uh, It's a lot more work than I probably needed to put on my plate uh, as, you know, I am the writer. I'm also acting in it as well as uh, directing, co-directing anyway. So it's a lot of work, and, and that's exactly why... Uh, I've been sort of behind in my work, so to speak. Uh, the the a lot of interest is being built already a, around this production. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and grandstand say it's going to be better than anything, uh, but it's going to be good. Uh, the cast that we have in place now is is fucking terrific. They're very talented, and they have street credit. That's something that's very important. You cannot fake street. Uh, a lot of films and a lot of TV shows uh, typically go out and get these grade. F, grade D, whatever the fuck it is, actors, and they can't portray the streets because they don't know what the streets are. They've never been on the streets. They don't know anybody in the streets. That's the difference. Uh, And any time that you take a risk uh, by not going out and getting, like, all of these high-paid actors, uh, you know, you run a risk of it maybe not being as good as it should be. But in this case, I think the complete is going to happen. Everybody that is involved with this uh, sort of has their own story, and they're all talented Uh, And so I'm really, really, really excited about that. I think it's going to be good. You can follow the Flanagan's TV show over on Facebook. Type in uh, the Flanagan's TV show. It'll pop right up. Give it a like. Give it a subscribe. Follow us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Also, you can follow us on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. That's very important as well. Now, a lot of people have been asking me, uh, how can I audition for a role? We do have roles left over. because obviously we want to cast outside the box and a lot of things. So here's how you can participate if this is what you want to do. If you live in South Philadelphia or right over the line in Jersey and you're interested in playing a role, uh, what you're going to want to do is go to uh, the Flanagan's TV show, excuse me, over on Facebook. And you're wanting to, you're going to want to keep your eyes over on that page because we're going to start putting out casting information. All the details will be there. 
You can also get some of the details on Twitter. We're probably not going to release any of that until probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so just keep it tuned to the Twitter page, uh, Mob Talk Radio, and then over at the Flanagan's TV show on Facebook for all your information. Uh, we are going to be looking for background actors and extras. So if you live in the New York City area, you want to come hang out on set and be part of a, uh, the background, absolutely you can do that. Uh, the same thing goes for, for people in South Philadelphia as well. But here's the deal. Uh, one of the things is going to be for any part that obviously has lines, you're going to have to audition. If you're looking for just background work or you just want to be an extra, uh, you're going to have to submit a headshot, current photo, uh, any experience you may have. If you don't have any experience being a background actor, it's okay. It's it's all right. Uh, but we will announce all of that later on next week. There's just a lot of stuff that we have to sort of get to uh, before you know it, it begins. So. All that being said, that's what's going on with the Flanagans. Uh, but like I said, go over to Facebook and check out the Flanagans TV show. Give a like, give a subscribe, uh, share it. Uh, you can get all the updated information as we go along. And like I said, we're, we're going to begin to shoot uh, the last weekend in September. So it, it's taken all, there's been a lot of processes here to get to this point. So we're pretty much all systems go now. Uh, and we're really excited about it. I think it's going to be really good. I think that uh, I think the acting is going to surprise a lot of people because, you know, already there's these naysayers talking shit. And that's what I want. I want you to talk shit. I want you to hate it because what we're going to unveil to the world is going to be the likes of something that's never been seen before. That I'm confident in. Uh, so all that being said, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get to your Q&A and then get on to Charlie. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. The man, Benaglia. Stay tuned. On a given week, I'm out of town a lot. Uh, whether it's Philadelphia, it's New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, wherever the case may be, I'm always looking for a place where I can sit down and have a great dinner. Uh, ambiance is key. Price is obviously key. But the most important thing is, is the food good? And there's a place I want to tell you about today. It's called Saltwater at Margate. Uh, if you are going down to the shore, because I know a lot of people in Philadelphia go to the shore... Uh, especially Margate, you're missing out on a great restaurant if you haven't been there. Uh, the name is Saltwater Margate. It's at 9401 Ventnor Avenue, Margate City, New Jersey. Uh, the phone number there is 609-289-8078. You can also visit them online at saltwatermargate.com. This place is unbelievable. Not only is the food absolutely superb, the price is great too. Uh, they're renowned for their pizza and their gnocchi. Uh, they have all kinds of different things from mussels to roast pork and Italian fare. So do yourself a favor. Do me a favor. Go and visit Saltwater Margate. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it is a place that I think at some point, if not already, there's going to be lines out the door and around the block. So if you're down on the shore, stop in, go to Saltwater Margate. At least check them out online at saltwatermargate.com. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We're going to get right into the Q&A. But once again, please remember that I can't get to all your questions. And if I didn't get to it today, we're definitely going to get to it down the line. All right. So with all that being said, we're going to jump right in and get to the first one. I barely believe what Jerry Capici reports. So I thought I'd ask you, is the elder Peter Gotti really ratting in hope of a reduced sentence? Okay, this has been distorted for the last week and a half. Peter Gotti's not ratting. It's a medical discharge that he's asking for because he's essentially dying in prison. He's using the First Step Act, First Step Act, which Trump put into uh, the, the court system for guys to try to get uh, released early and etc. Carmine Persico uh, tried using this. A lot of other guys have tried using this. It doesn't always work. It really doesn't work at all. Uh, but this, I don't know how we went from this being a medical discharge uh, to him ratting. Uh, it's not the case. Uh, I wish people would just really read the article. In this particular case, Jerry Capici wasn't telling, wasn't lying. He was telling the truth. Uh, it's simply just a medical discharge. So what? He wants to throw the mafia behind. He's like almost fucking 80-some years old, and he's dying. I don't think anybody's going to knock him uh, for wanting to get, get away from this stuff. Uh, so, yeah, the, there are going to be the purists who are going to, well, he's admitting the mafia exists, he's... He's saying he's done with the mafia. That's like ratting. It really isn't. But, you know, you could take whichever stance you want to take on that. However, he's not ratting. He just wants out of prison. I don't blame the guy. Will he get out? Absolutely 100%. No. Uh, it's not going to happen. And a large part of that's because of the murder conspiracy to kill Sammy Gravano. That's what's going to keep him in. And it's unfortunate. But 
Uh, that's just sort of how things work out. Uh, but he's not ratting. I just wish people would read the article uh, and not all of a sudden go on these wild goose chases of he's providing information, which is not the case. It's absolutely not the case, and, and it's it's more of a symptom of people just not reading an article. They read a headline, and they buy it, uh, and you can't, you can't buy headlines. Read the article and investigate for yourself. All right. I re- I'm following you over on Instagram, and I recently saw that Dave Ratweiser is following you. What the hell is up with that? I don't know. It was a. Uh, it was probably like around eleven thirty at night. I I got the notification and I looked at it a couple of times. Thought maybe it was a fake account. I checked it out and I went, ah, nope. Got to block that prick immediately. Uh, I don't know what he's up to. Uh, he had me blocked on most of his media accounts to begin with, which is his choice. He has the right to do that. Uh, but I don't like it. I don't like the fact that he's that he was even looking at my page. It it, it sort of. I don't want to level any allegations, but I have some serious reservations about when some of the stuff happened with Phil Narducci and, and the FBI tried to tie me into that nonsense and that fucking mess, which is certifiably it did happen. People who want to say I'm full of shit can say whatever they want, but I, I know what happened as a result. Uh, but the fact that the FBI, the prosecution wanted to drag me into that fucking nonsense, uh, wanted to subpoena me, wanted to search and seizure and all this crazy shit that they wanted to do to me. Uh, realistically, you know, my show has a lot of listeners, uh, is it a million fucking listeners? No, I'm not that big. Uh, but when all of this sort of kind of happened, I started thinking to myself, you know what? I beat Anastasia and Ratweiser to the punch. I got the information out there before they did. They piggybacked off of me, uh, which a lot of people attacked them and said, stop lying. You know, this guy got it out before anybody else, but you know, they're a bigger platform than I am. Uh, and I think that there was some resentment there, and I also think that one of those two goofballs, and, and like I'm saying, I'm alleging, uh, this is not based on any facts, but I find it very hard to believe that the FBI just one day had nothing better to do uh, and says, oh, we're going to listen to this show, because uh, they're not going to get any viable bullshit out of me, I'm not going to talk about what's current on my show, uh, and I, I really believe that that one of those two fucking dunces sort of told the FBI that I was outing an informant, I was putting out information that could get the informant hurt or whatever the fucking case may be, uh, and I think that they used my name, and I think that's how it went down, because believe me, no FBI agent who's in the middle of a fucking case or a prosecutor who's in the middle of a fucking case is going to stop to listen to what the fuck I have to say, right? But for some reason, they were pointed in that direction, and it started a world of shit. So I'm of the belief that these two fucking idiots did this. I can't prove it, so it's just an allegation I'm making. I'm not delusional. I'm not fucking crazy. I just know how those two fucking operate. Uh, So it it wouldn't surprise me in the least if one of those two jerk-offs did this. Uh, but, but that being said, the fact that he started following me on Instagram is a little creepy to me. I, I have a speculation that at some point they're going to try to hot dog me, uh, and put me into something stupid, which doesn't exist. Cause that's what these guys do for a living. So, you know, I just blocked the guy. That's all I can do. I don't like either one of them. I think I've been well on the record about that. I don't like the way that they behave. They don't behave like men. They behave like cowards and sissies and they hide in bushes. So, uh, you know, we'll see what happens from it. But no, nah, I'm not going to let the guy follow me because he's either sniping for information or he's sniping for shit on me. Uh, and I'm just not going to deal with it, you know. So all that being said, I hope that that answers that question. All right. Where would you rank Joe Zarilli among the other great bosses in Cosa Nostra? He ran the Detroit family for over 30 years. Uh, look, obviously being the longest tenured boss um, in the mafia says a lot. 30 years is a long time. Uh, I don't think guys who really make headlines or who are super well-known make make for a good boss. Uh, and I'm not using Gotti as a reference or Capone, but just for a second. If you take Gotti and Capone, the, each in their own right for a small amount of time, they were, they were good bosses, but their notoriety and their, uh, their publicity overshadowed anything that they could have done. So whereas you take a guy like Ray Patriarca or Joe Zarilli, who were bosses for 30 years respectively— they were able to stay under the radar for the most part. I mean, people knew who they were, but because they didn't get seen out in public every other day and, and stayed away from the public spotlight, that's what made them good. And that's why Joe's are really, I would rank at the top with the Russell Buffalino, uh, with the Carl, uh, Carlo Gambino and the Carlos Marcello and some of these other guys. Maybe not Marcello. That's probably not a, <laughs> a good fucking uh, d- example, but I would rank him at the top. Absolutely. All right. 
Would the Purple Gang have been able to hold their ground if Al Capone had tried to move in on Detroit during Prohibition? Uh, the Purple Gang was also known as the Sugar House Gang, but they really come to prominence uh, during Prohibition times. Uh, they, they began pretty much as petty criminals, and they ended up being a force to be reckoned with. Uh, they would move on to hijacking, narcotics, and a bunch of other stuff. But Al Capone didn't want to move rackets inside of Detroit, so what he did was he ended up forming an alliance with the Purple Gang because he wanted to avoid war. But by the 1920s, uh, the, the Purple Gang pretty much was leading organized crime in Detroit. Drugs, gambling, you name it, they did it. Uh, had Al Capone decided against having a business relationship with them and instead wanted to oust them, I think he would have been really fighting a serious war that he might have lost. Uh, I think ultimately the Purple Gang would have ha would have been able to hold their ground as long as it was just Capone they were fighting. If it was just Capone, they would have survived. But if they had to fight other mob families, forget about it. They, they wouldn't have lasted. Uh, and I think that that's probably the most realistic answer that I can give you. All right. Uh, did Abe Burbs Bernstein help Capone with the St. Valentine's Day massacre by gaining Bugs Moran's trust and telling him a boost shipment was coming to the spot, which actually was the place where the massacre took place? Yes, 100%. Uh, it was a complete ruse. They tricked Bugs Moran into coming in, and they, they killed everybody, and it absolutely worked. 100% factual and true. All right, if Lucky Luciano was a part of the young mobsters coming up, how was he able to take over from older mobsters when he created the commission? Commission, Was there no bark back from the older mobsters? Uh, look, if there was bark back, he would have essentially just killed him. Uh, what Luciano was able to do in, in a relatively short time was pretty amazing. Uh, he ended up wiping out the old guard, and everybody else sort of fell in line. Uh, making money in business made more sense than bloodshed at that point, but I think for the most part, he was right in eliminating uh, one person overruling everybody else. Uh, that's what Massaria wanted. He wanted to be the boss of bosses, and I think Luciano saw that as a hindrance uh, and not necessarily a positive thing for business. He would rather focus on everybody earning money together than to fight wars over territory. Uh, it, because uh, Luciano saw it as greed was the root of all evil. Granted, everybody wanted to make money, but the problem was is a lot of the shit that was going on in the days in Brooklyn, especially with Sicilian clans, was greed. Uh, and Luciano saw that as the demise of the mafia uh, as a whole. Uh, but the entirety of how Luciano saw things was, look, let's just make the money, let's stay out of the view of the police, uh, and it just made more sense than allowing the old mustache Pete's to control everything. And like I said, greed was the total motivator of everything, what the old guard and Luciano saw it as a way out, and it was the right decision to make. All right. Uh, back in the 60s, singers like Bobby Rydell and Lou Christie, did they have mob ties? Uh, look, back in that time period, I, I don't think that you could probably name a single, uh, a single musical act back in the 60s, even going back to the 40s with Sinatra. I don't think you can name many that didn't have mob ties. Uh, you know, the mob was the one, the one group who owned radio stations. They owned many of the companies in the record industry. They owned the venues, uh, and, and that's the big thing. Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin, uh, Skinny D'Amato, who owned the 500 Club in Atlantic City, really launched the careers of Martin and Lewis and Frank Sinatra. Without the 500 Club and without Skinny D'Amato, Sinatra might not ever have gotten the right exposure. Uh, Frank, yeah, Frankie Valli is another example. Uh, his roots go all the way back to Gyp DiCarlo, and that helped him out of a ton of jams. Uh, you know, and, and, and actually was able to get him into some of the most exclusive clubs. That's how it operated back in the day. Uh, and, and today it's, it's really not so much, but I've heard a lot of nasty shit about Tommy Matola, but that's got to be for another show because that's a, a huge thing. All right. We hear so much about the rats, but who are some guys who manned up when the, sh when the shit went flying and they didn't rat? I heard that Nino Gaggi was given every chance in the world to turn state's evidence, but he refused. And Sonny Black faced certain death, but he chose to die before he ever could rat. Listen, here's reality, all right? Uh, I'm sure you've heard this before. This is somewhat going to be a regurgitation of everything I have said before. But look, the feds want you to believe that you only have three choices in life, okay? You have death, 
you have ratting, or you're going to prison the rest of your life. So the mob's either going to kill you because we're going to put it out on the streets that you're a rat, or you're going to go to the prison the rest of your life, or you can join Team Fucking Fed and everything is forgiven. You go about your fucking life with a new name and a fucking EBT card and whatever else the fuck it is. But there's been a lot of guys who took it on the chin and got sentences they didn't deserve. Tony Salerno was not the boss of the Genovese crime family when he was found guilty at the commission trial. The government knew that. Uh, they knew that Vinnie Gigante at the time was, but they never admitted to that during the trial. Tony ends up getting 100 years for absolutely nothing. The same thing happened to Carmine Persco. He officially was not the boss of the Colombo crime family at the time. Government knew it, didn't allow that information to get out, and these guys get 100 years apiece. Uh, Tony Slero didn't have to take 100 years in prison. He could have just as easily turned around and said, oh, I'm not the fucking boss. Fuck all these guys. But he didn't. He took it on, he took it on the chin and in the ass. That's, that's the truth. Uh, they end up getting life sentence, but they never utter a word. Jimmy Burke, same sort of thing. Jimmy Burke could have dropped a dime, never did. Took a life sentence like a man. Vic Arena, took it on the chin, never uttered a fucking word. So many guys have just taken it and not said a word. John Gotti never uttered a word. Never uttered a word. And he died chained to a fucking bed, choking on his own blood. All right? Joey Merlino never uttered a fucking word. So there are guys that, that are tough, and they will never. Joey Merlino is never going to talk. Joey Merlino will take two in the head before he ever utters a fucking word about anybody. In fact, I would say that 95% of the Philly guys would take a bullet before they ever fucking uttered a word. You know, you can't say that about the Bananos. They've had a lot of problems. It seems like every other year somebody's ratting. You don't have those problems necessarily in Philadelphia. And I, I always I use Philadelphia because it always comes from the outside in. It's never from the inside out. The day that they get somebody from the inside that goes out, it, they're fucked. They're fucked. Uh, but like I said, you know, I, the, the foundation there is strong. And I just don't see that as, as ever being really the reality of it. All right. Can you give... A little information on how the window scam actually went. I heard it was shared by the families. Was it like the Concrete Club? I know they had Pete Savino, uh, who was with the Genovese's, but I heard Ca Gas Pipe Castle was collecting uh, money, et cetera. Whose racket was it? Uh, the windows, concrete, drywall, it, it all really kind of runs the same. Uh, they controlled the unions. They controlled the workers. They can inflate the prices. And then they can in, in, they can essentially inflate the union dues, and they can lower and raise the union wages. Uh, if a bucket of concrete costs, say, a dollar, the mob would say, okay, you got direct access to our union. You don't have to pay, and you're going you're gonna to have to pay $3 a bucket, but we're going to make sure that you get your concrete every day. You're not going to have any union problems. We're going to get you other jobs, and your jobs uh, will be fine, everything. But if you don't, concrete's not going to show. Windows are not going to show. Workers aren't going to show. You're going to have union problems. So the mob controls every aspect of construction in New York City. Even today, they still control it. Uh, but windows were no different. You control the unions, the product, and then you rig the bid uh, for any complex. Uh, the Javits Center, if you go back uh, to the time period of the Javits Center, that was a big Tony Salerno thing. And, and one of the big fronts, one of the big, uh, excuse me, beefs was between uh, Salerno and the Westies because uh, the Westies didn't want to give it up. Mickey Spillane thought it belonged to him. The mob thought differently, and that's why a war started over that, just because of the pure uh, construction costs and, and the, the fucking concrete that was being poured. So it all works the same. Every mob racket essentially works the fucking same. All right, Crazy Phil Leonetti in his book always talks how he was close to the Merlino brothers but said he hated the son. He said the son was a punk, uh, and he thought he the, the, basically, okay, let me rearrange this a little bit. Crazy Phil says in his book he was close to the Merlino brothers but hated Joey and said Joey was a punk and that Joey thought he was a tough guy, but he was nothing but a hothead. Uh, so here's the thing with Phil Leonetti. Uh First of all, I think whatever Phil Leonetti suffers from, be it delusions, be it hallucinations, I really think he probably has a mental disorder. If you have not seen that fucking 60 Minutes interview that he did where he's wearing the fucking raccoon on his head, looks like fucking Frank Vincent with fucking AIDS, you really got to see that one. It, it is the most inept, hysterical interview I've ever seen. First of all, Leonetti is a piece of shit, rat, nothing. Uh, 
if, if you look at his story, history at this point, Joey Merlino has a longer run than anybody at this point. Excuse me. Joey Merlino has had a longer run than anybody at this point. And so I think that there's some validity to that. Uh, Scarfo's reign was, was fairly short. Bruno, maybe not as short, but Merlino has been the guy for give or take 25 years now. So there's something to be said for that. Uh, but I think anything that, that Leonetti wants to say is just ridiculous at this point. Uh, Scarfo had a tiny run. Leonetti had a tiny run. Uh, he's just a, he's just a fucking rat. I don't buy anything the guy says. And you really, listen, here's the thing. You lose all credibility when you put your own uncle and everybody else around you that murdered for you, made you wealthy, and you put them in prison because you're a coward and a bitch. Leonetti couldn't even fucking become a fucking federal witness before he got sentenced. It wasn't until after he got hammered for like 80 years or whatever the fuck it was, 60, 50, 40, whatever the fuck the case may be. It was after he gets convicted, he calls and starts crying to the FBI, help me, help me, like a bitch. You know, uh, and that's just the reality of it. So I've never read the guy's book, nor would I. I, I don't I, I don't want to prescribe to anything that that guy says. Like I said, go to YouTube, type in Philly and Eddie 60 Minutes interview. You'll see what the fuck I'm saying. So, Phil, if you're listening, do yourself a favor. Get the fucking Frank Vincent raccoon wig off your fucking head. You look like a raccoon's crotch, you prick. All right. Let's see. All right. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a question. Okay, uh, what's the Philadelphia crime family's name right now? Because we had this, we had the Bruno era, the Scarfo era. So whose name would it fall under? Some really no crime family. Don't hold me to that. That's just, I mean, would you 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 think that guys say yes? We are the Philadelphia mafia. Sure, I'm sure guys say that. We're the South Philly mob. Sure, guys will probably say that too. I I don't know. Uh, but it's still a really knows crime family, uh, you know, at least from the perspective of what the FBI says. You can take my word for it or you can, like, insert your own name. Uh, but, you know, if you believe what the FBI says, then there you have it, uh, I, you know. Um, but as far as I care, it's the Merlino crime family as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but once again, you know, I'm not the expert. I'm just a guy with a fucking mouth. So, uh, you know. I, I think realistically, too, look who's look who's been the boss or look who's allegedly been the boss since the 90s. That ought to tell you something, too. All right. On Boardwalk Empire, Frankie, uh, Frankie Yale was the one who shot Big Joe Colosimo. Is that true? There's always been rumors about this. Uh, what we do know is that Johnny Torrio effectively ordered it. But why? Uh, Torrio wanted to move into the prohibition rackets and Big Jim Colosimo just didn't want to do it. Uh, he thought it was too risky, created too much. He obviously didn't really have his mind wrapped around being an entrepreneur, uh, but it created a huge problem considering that Colosimo owned a ton of brothels, had his hands into all sorts of different rackets. This was a way that everyone could make a ton of money, and Torrio just kind of looked at it when he said no and was like, yeah, I don't think so, asshole. Uh, and ultimately, Torrio really just saw the amount of money that could be made, and with Cos Colosimo refusing, something had to be done uh, And because there was just way too much money to lose. So according to law enforcement, uh, he brought in Frankie Yale to handle the hit. Uh, it, it is, though, I think, you know, 100% is it is it 100% accurate? Yeah, I think it probably is. There were rumors that Capone pulled the trigger, but I highly doubt that because Frankie Yale was a guy they used multiple times. Uh, so I honestly think that the reality is, is that Torrio brought in Frankie Yale and it got uh, pretty much handled. Okay. Uh, this guy sent me a link, and it the link was to the Gambino family new boss, and they asked for my opinion. Okay, well, let me answer this question, and I'm assuming that it says Lorenzo Menino, and Dominic Cefalu, and et cetera, et cetera. So let me tell you something that a lot of people don't realize. Frank Cali was not the boss of the Gambino crime family. That has been misreported for fucking months. Uh was he on the, the, the front boss, 100% front boss? Uh, the Gambinos have used a front boss structure for a long time, but was Frank Cali the boss? No. What people are not reporting is Frank Cali was put into that position by other people. Uh, so all of this stuff that they make and this nonsense they report about Frank Cali was the boss, he never was. He was a front boss. That was it. So do I believe that 
that the same assholes that kept saying that Frank Kelly was the actual boss are coming out with Lorenzo Menino and Dominic Cephalou and all these other guys. Don't believe that either. Uh, look, unless you're in it, you don't fucking know. That's the truth. Have I heard the same rumors? Of course. Rumors are simply that rumors. But if they got the Frank Cali shit wrong, what the fuck makes you think they got this one right? All right. What is? I really believe that Cosa Nostra took out JFK. How about Bobby? Now, we are going to do a big show on the Kennedys, including a biograph of Joe Kennedy and some of his narcotics stealing and bank swindling and, 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 and bootlegging. Anybody that tells you that the Kennedys made their fortune legitimately is full of shit. I've gotten into arguments with people that they want to put the Kennedys on some kind of imaginary pedestal that they never did anything wrong. Their father was a fucking criminal. The rest of them are all criminals. And it just, you know, karma's a bitch. And I think we've seen this for decades with the Kennedy family. Uh, but let's look at reality here. Was JFK the biggest issue? Not really. For the government, he was. The Bay of Pigs, he fucked that up. They were really worried about Kennedy in a lot of ways because they couldn't neuter him like they do with every other president. They couldn't bend him. But really, Bobby was the bigger problem than JFK. Uh, Bobby was the reason why the mob lost control over JFK. The mob always thought that ridding themselves of John F. Kennedy would pretty much shut Bobby up. But really, in reality, it had the reverse effect. What they should have done is kill Bobby. That's the truth uh, if we're going to play out theories. Uh, I just don't think the mob... And the government really realized the type of piss amp that Bobby Kennedy was going to become. Uh, but do I think that Bobby Kennedy was whacked by the government? 100%. You can believe Sirhan, Sirhan, and all that crazy shit. I don't. I've never believed it. Uh, Bobby, Bobby did a couple of things after John F. Kennedy. First of all, he was going to run for president, which was a fucking nightmare for everybody involved. Uh, also, he blamed and openly and publicly blamed Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, for the death of his brother. He even confronted him, asking him, why did you have my brother killed? Jackie Kennedy said the same thing to Johnson. If you l listen to some of the Johnson tapes, he says some, n not incriminating shit, but he says some very circumspect shit about John F. Kennedy. Uh, but at some point, Bobby Kennedy just got way too ballsy. Remember, Bobby's the one that had Carlos Marcello kidnapped and dropped into the jungles of Guatemala, thinking that Marcello would never, ever find his way back to the United States, but he was wrong about that. Uh, you know, that in and of itself, if we just take that one, that one factual thing of Bobby kidnapping Marcelo and, uh, using the CIA to do it, putting him on a plane and throwing him out the fucking window with a parachute into the jungles of Guatemala, that in and of itself would get Bobby killed. That in and of itself, the mere fact that he was blaming the government for his brother's death, that, that's a whole nother issue. I think that if we go back in history, and let's go on the premise that the mafia killed JFK. If they did that, they fucked up, and let me tell you why. Bobby was the problem. If they would have just neutralized Bobby from day one, JFK probably would have been left alone. He would have seen it for what it was, and he would have fallen in line, and I think everything would have gone right. Uh, I think that the government sort of uh, probably... Uh, was was more fearful that JFK, and this is going to sound awful, but with the civil rights movement, JFK was backing that, and that scared the shit out of the United States government. Uh, Martin Luther King gets gets clipped, uh, Medgar Evers, and, and the list just goes on and on and on of the things that happened. But I think had the mob moved on Bobby, they would have been better off, because Bobby was the real fucking enemy of the mob, not JFK, uh, because JFK, through his father, allowed, you know, the mob helped get him elected, and, and we'll go into that whole uh, case here next two, in the next two weeks, but the problem is, is that Bobby was the one who started pulling the strings, and the minute that, the minute he becomes attorney, attorney general, and he launches into all these committee he hearings, trying to fucking decimate the mafia, he was the fucking problem, not JFK, so the mob whacked the wrong fucking guy, as far as I'm concerned, all right, who was more powerful, Angelo Bruno or Joe Zarelli? Joe Zarelli, hands down, I think was was definitely uh, more powerful man for man. But I think that Angelo Bruno had a lot of, excuse me, a lot of ties, especially with Carlo Gambino. That would have made him ultimately more powerful in numbers versus one on one. All right. Will there be any Irish Republican Army related stories in the Flanagans? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There is going to be, not in the pilot episode, but there is going to be an Irish Republican Army contingent. There is going to be a narrative and a storyline that has to do with that, but you're going to have to tune in to get all the answers to that. Uh, but yes, 
All right. Um, let's see. What family did Wildman Grasso from New Haven, Connecticut, work for, uh, et cetera? He began. Uh, he was independent. Okay. All right. So who did Wild Wildman Will Grasso in New Haven work work with? Uh, he he likely started really. He was an independent fucking criminal. Uh, and he ends up bouncing around with the Genoveses, but it wasn't until he gets put in prison where he actually meets Ray Patriarca and they become really tight that he gets inducted into the Patriarca crime family and then he would end up running a crew uh, which pushed the Patriarchas deep into western Massachusetts and into Connecticut and ultimately he would become Raymond Jr. Patriarca's underboss. So that's sort of how he got started. All right. Uh, have you heard of the company Hawaiian Syndicate and do you think that they are still active? I think that they are, but they're very loose, and a lot of people may not know what the company is or what the Hawaiian Syndicate is, so let me just give a brief sort of dissertation on that. Uh, the Hawaiian Syndicate ran really between this, the 1960s and 1990s. Uh, it began as an offshoot of the triads, the Yakuza, the Korean gangs, and also as well Samoan gangs. Believe it or not, it was actually a Korean that established the first organized crime group in Hawaii in 1962. His name was George Chung, and he re ended up recruiting Koreans, Japanese, Chinese, Samoans, and native Hawaiians. Uh, Chung was a lot like Lucky Luciano in the sense that he established a system for all the gangs to make money without fighting each other over turf and territory. Sort of like a commission, but it really wasn't the commission. He just sort of organized everything into a structure. Uh, Chung, however, would not survive and would end up getting killed in 1967. And as Chung gets sort of put out to pasture, a power vacuum ensues, and, and a Samoan name, and I'm going to pronounce the Samoan name wrong, I'm telling you this right now, uh, Alima Latoy, Leota, uh, Alima, Le Jesus Christ, this is, this is a fucking tongue twister, Alima Leota. All right, we'll just go with that. Uh, he ends up taking over, and he would form his organization, and they would be called effectively the company. In 1969, Wilford uh, Palua, who was second in command under Leota, would begin to recruit and build the ranks. Uh, Palua would end up taking the group into narcotics, gambling, prostitution, union racketeering, and even extortion. They had a vast network of heroin smuggling. Anybody who did business in Hawaii had to pay Palua or they would be killed. He didn't fuck around. They were so vast that they ended up controlling many of the Hawaiian communities in California and even started to move into Las Vegas. Uh, but legend has it that two Chicago mobsters were sent to Hawaii to teach Pulua a lesson for putting his nose and his business into Vegas. And allegedly, uh, Pulua had them killed, dismembered them, put them into a trunk of a car, sent the car back to Chicago with a note attached saying, delicious, send more. So, I mean, if that's even accurate, this guy's a fucking psychopath. But in 1972, Polo was rise, really comes crumbling down as he would be arrested for tax evasion. They couldn't get him on nothing else, so they used the Al Capone thing. Uh, they used tax evasion on him, and he would be sentenced to 24 years. And when he gets out in 1983, he was pretty much all but done with uh, organized crime. He sort of moved into politics. But uh, with Polo in prison, the organization struggled with infighting and politics, uh, but then what really fucked them up was they ended up killing the son of a prosecutor, and it really marked the end of their power base. Uh, today, Hawaii still has organized crime, don't get me wrong, but it's sort of morphed back into the old days prior to the organization of the company uh, with smaller crews. They have the triads, the Yakuza, the Samoans, and, and et cetera, et cetera. It's not what it once was, but it's still prevalent in Hawaii today. All right. How tough was how tough or crazy was Tommy D. Simone? Uh, not as much as the lore. Uh, was he nuts? Absolutely, but nothing like the Joe Pesci portrayal in Goodfellas. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, granted, look, he was involved in hijackings, murder, extortion, theft. A lot has been inflated over the years. Uh, according to legend, uh, when he was losing a game of cards, he would toss darts. I know somebody else who likes to toss darts at people. <laughs> Jeez, oh, that that one's going to get me in trouble. But uh, but he would he would toss darts at people, uh, and he he allegedly tossed darts at Tommy Agro, which I highly don't fucking believe that because Tommy Agro would have fucking killed him. Tommy Agro was not somebody he wanted to fuck with, so I don't I don't necessarily believe that. But also, Tommy D. Simone was a massive junkie, uh, which led to him doing a lot of erratic and stupid shit. Uh, this is another reason why I think that the legend got a little bit out of hand. Uh, nobody really trusted him because of his drug habit. Henry Hill speculated that DeSimone killed 11 people. 
I don't I, I don't believe any of that. I, I think it was probably two or three, if that, maybe one on his own and maybe two other conspiracies. Uh, and he didn't even take part in the, you know, what he did do was he did take part in the wor- murder of William Benvena, who was a member of the Carmine Fatico's crew of the Gambino crime family. Uh, but it was the, the murder of Benvena was not over a shine box comment. Every time I see these people post this shit, go get your fucking shine box. I laugh because it was never said it was made up for the movie. A good fellas. It's a funny fucking line. Don't get me wrong. But the reality is it's not true. It, it was essentially Benvena got out of prison, wanted his rackets back. Burke had made them profitable. Burke says, told them to fuck off. Ben Vena got wise. Burke killed him. That's simply the way it went. Uh, but but Ben Vena, a lot of people say that he was in Gotti's crew. He wasn't. He was in Carmine Fatico's crew, which Gotti was in that crew as well. Uh, but a lot of people try to make assertions that really just aren't true. All right. If Neil Delacroix got selected as boss over Paul Castellano, do you think Paul, Nino, and Roy would have wanted... Uh, Neil Delacroach and Gotti out of that faction. Look, had Neil been named boss, I think respectively, Gotti would have probably, what would have happened is Neil would have become boss, Gotti would have taken over Neil's old crew, and I think ultimately what Neil Delacroach might have done is killed Roy DeMeo. But then again, and the reason would be is because Roy was reckless, but then again, it's hard to play devil's advocate here. Uh, I, I think likely... He probably would have kept tighter rein on guys like DeMeo and even Gravano. They would have kept tighter reins on them. Uh, I don't think Neil would have tolerated some of the stuff that Paul allowed to go on in that crime family because Delacroach was a killer, uh, whereas Paul would order a death very easily, but Paul would rather, I think, in a large part, focus on business. You know, It was about money and, and profitability, whereas I think Neil was more like, grab a gun and go do it. Uh, but Paul really put himself in a sandwich, a shit sandwich at the end of the day that he couldn't get out of. But I think if Neil had been promoted to boss, I think Paul probably would have slid in as a fucking underboss. Uh, but I think things would have been very, very differently. All right. Did Irish Eddie Boyle have any part in the killing of Frank Heidel, Jimmy's brother, or was it just a rumor? Um, a couple of guys in his crew were apparently made because of it. Uh, but what was in it for Boyle? Probably what was in it for Boyle is just revenge for Heidel turning rat. Uh, you know, but it was never really proven that Frank Heidel was a rat. It was sort of a suspicion that the Gambinos had, and they had one. They they had one for a good reason, uh, and the reason was is because everybody kept getting pinched around him except for him. And so it sort of made, you know, anytime you have this in organized crime or, or even crime in general, it doesn't have to be necessarily organized crime. But if everybody's taking part in the same crimes and one guy just of the group is never getting arrested, chances are the guy's a fucking rat. And that's what they started to su- suspect. Uh, and that was enough for the Gambinos. Uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, Boyle is a long associate of the Gambino crime family, uh, and he handled it probably because he was asked to do it or he volunteered to do it because it gives him stature within the crime family, and that's why guys do stuff like that. All right. Uh, Your opinion, Geno's or Pat's? Uh, Man, you guys guys are killing me with the Philly shit. Uh, Listen, I I think it all tastes the same. Uh, I prefer Geno's. That's just me. Uh, Even Oregon Steaks, you know— it is what it is. Uh, the only place I won't eat is Tony Luke's because it's garbage. It's horrible. It tastes like shit. I don't care. It's gross. I don't like it. That's just the truth. That's my opinion. People may like it. All right. Did Ron Previty? Did Ron Previty ever see his feet? Did Ron Previty ever see his feet? All right. If I had to give an answer to this, I could. I could. Uh, let me think of a sarcastic one. All right. Did Ron Previty ever see his feet? Probably only when Ralph Natale was bending him over while John VC watched. How about that? Ron Previty and Joey Merlino. I can barely breathe. I can barely see my feet. What the fuck? I love George Anastasia. That fat fuck. All right. Who's running Dallas these days? Dallas, as far as I know, is inactive. Completely inactive. All right. Do the Native Americans have any crime families? Uh, they do, but not like traditional organized crime, uh, especially when you move up into Canada, they, you know, obviously they run the reservations, they can, they control and move a lot of tobacco and cigarettes. So they're involved to that extent. But if you're looking at a, an Indian tribe to be formed like, uh, Kosanosha, no, absolutely not. 
All right, when did Angelo Ruggiero get made, and do you know who he made his bones with? One, I don't know, and two, I don't know. I have no idea what year Angelo Ruggiero was made. I don't know if he killed anybody or who he killed or who he was with when he was killed. I have no clue. That I don't know. Uh, why didn't they whack Joe Bonanno? Was it because he was an agent and they knew it? Uh, Joe Bonanno was not an FBI agent. Uh, he did drop dimes on people, and that is true. A lot of people try to argue with me saying Joe Bonanno was never a rat, but he kind of was. Uh, he told the law enforcement a lot of shit about a lot of people, uh, and really it was about his enemies. Uh, but was he a guy that, like, put people in prison? We could argue that, you know, both ways. Uh, but it, was he a snitch? Absolutely. Uh, but then again, there were other guys like Frank Costello and, and Gar Gambino that, that did the sort of same thing. So they all – that seemed to be the way that the system worked back in the 60s. I mean, uh, Carmine Galante got fucked. Uh, Vito Genovese got ultimately fucked. It was treachery. Everybody dropped dimes on somebody to kind of get him out of the way. So they're all kind of guilty of it. Uh, but he wasn't an agent, no. Um, and, and listen, I, I know I dog Joe Bonanno a lot, but Joe Bonanno was a very, very, very shrewd, smart guy. The problem was is that I think he relied too heavily on support from other people, and that's what put him in a shit position. That It's kind of hard to run a family when you live half halfway across the fucking country. You got guys out on the streets doing murders for you, selling drugs for you, and yet you're going to live fucking 1,500 miles away. Guys sort of get a resentment for that, and it's just the way that things happen. Uh, you know, and Joe Bonanno was, was really a very uh, you know, high profile, uh, but he ended up getting chased from the mob, and, and I think had the older bosses like Gambino live to see him get involved in that shit in, in, in Los Angeles or Vegas, was it? One of the two with the car dealerships. I can't remember what it was. I think it was in Los Angeles. I think they would have killed him because he was told to stay the fuck out of mob business. You're done. You're retired. Stay the fucking Arizona. Look like a prune. Don't open your mouth. But the fact that a lot of the old guard bosses had started to die off, I think had they lived and seen that shit, they probably would have killed him. I don't think they would have hesitated. Uh, especially the old world bosses. The new guys, probably not so much because they were just like, fuck him, he's out in Arizona, let him die, who gives a fuck? But I think the reality is, is the ones who threw him out of the mob, the ones who fucking had hatred for him, probably would have popped him. I don't think they would have fucking hesitated. All right. They killed Meyer Lansky's stepson. Do you have any idea why? I have often heard he was whacked, but never really the reason why. Uh, the guy's name is Richard uh, Schwartz. Uh he was charged in murder with murder in 1977 because what he did was he effectively killed a guy named Greg Teriaka, uh, who he went drinking with. Uh, they were at a bar called The Forge, and basically uh, the argument was allegedly over a $10 tip or a tab, uh, and Schwartz just fucking pulled out a gun and blew his fucking head off. Now, why was Schwartz killed? Ultimately, it had nothing to do with the mafia. It had nothing to do with Meyer Lansky. It was revenge from friends of Greg Teriaka's friendship, family, whatever the case may be, but it had nothing to do with the mafia whatsoever. All right. Uh, was Why wasn't Charlie Carneglia punished for killing the court clerk in the 80s since things like that are a big mob no-no? Uh, I read the guy was a nut, a junkie, an alcoholic, and a stone-cold psycho. Uh, absolutely fucking psycho. Uh, I, you know what? I, I don't know why he was. I, I have a lot of questions about how John Gotti ran his crime family, and I'm going to be honest with you. And I've never said this publicly, and I'm going to say it now. Sammy Gravano killed a 16-year-old kid. The reason that I seem to get from people is that, well, Gotti didn't know. Bullshit. They all know. They know who kills who, what, when, and where. It's a gossip social club. Everybody knows who kills anybody. OK, so the fact that Gotti knew that Gravano killed a 16 year old and did nothing about it, that's a problem. Uh, Charles Carneglia kills a fucking court clerk. Nothing is done about it. You know, I, so listen, and, and, and can I say for 100 percent that John Gotti Sr. didn't know that this happened? No, I can't say that. But I think that just based on the fact that Gravano killed a 16 year old, he should have been gutted and hung from a fucking rafter somewhere. Carneglia, we can make an argument either way. But. I think that we have to look, look at gas pipe. He killed the wrong fucking person. So these are a lot of things that I always wonder about. But if you look at the Gambinos, this happened a little bit too much for my tastes. I don't understand why they didn't move on Gravano when he killed a kid. Uh, knowing, knowing, um, knowing members of the Gotti family, which I do. Uh, I think what I can say is that had he known, I think all hell would have broken loose. So I'm not saying that he knew. 
uh, but I find it very hard to believe that at some point somebody didn't hear something. I, I just don't buy that. Uh, does it make it right? No. Uh, but I, I just... It just seems like a repetitive thing with the Gambino crime family, at least in the back in the 80s, you know, and, and I can't fault one guy over another guy, uh, but I think at some point y you you lose credibility is uh, in certain ways when you don't handle shit right like that, but that's just that's just my two, two cents. I'm, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying. All right. Um, what are some misconceptions about smaller mafia families like Philadelphia and Providence? Uh, I think, okay, let's take this one at a time. With Providence, I'm very disappointed in Providence. Very disappointed in Providence. Uh, I, I think uh, post-Patriarcha Jr., uh, you know, I, I think that what had followed Patriarcha was a joke. The Angelos were a fucking joke. They bought their way into the mafia. They didn't earn it. Uh, and I think, you know, it, pass down that, you know, you, what you've seen, with the exception of a, a few people, uh, like Matty. Uh, though those are good guys, smart guys. Uh, but I think the, the, the thing has been is that, and I've always said this, when you move your power base from Boston to Providence back and forth every four years, it's a problem. Uh, then again, when you're in the smallest state in the fucking United States, being in Rhode Island, it, it's kind of hard to stay low key. Uh, and I think that, just Providence in general has just been decimated time and time and time again, and I don't know if they ever really recovered uh, from the death of Patriarcha. That's just my two cents. Now, does that does that mean to say they're no longer valid? No. Uh, there are some guys there that are absolute heavyweights, absolute tough guys, very, very smart guys. Uh, I just think that what if there's anything that people underestimate with them is the fact that they will fucking kill you. <laughs> I can't say it any better than that. Uh, with Philadelphia, I think people underestimate the numbers. I think people underestimate the, the violence and veracity of who they are. Let's Because, look, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the mafia, you're in the mafia. I don't give a fuck if you're in Delaware. I don't give a fuck if you're in Oklahoma. I don't give a fuck if you're in Virginia. I don't give a fuck if you're in fucking Kansas or wherever the fuck. The reality is the mafia is the mafia is the mafia. It's about money, murder, and mayhem. It's always going to be that way. And I think the one thing that people just so fucking don't understand, especially about Philadelphia, is you can't fuck around there. You know, guys are serious. They mean business. And I think that typically, and this is the media's fault. Media and television have done this to Philadelphia for years. They've always made Philadelphia the bitch of New York. They've always made New Jersey the bitch of New York. But let the truth be told is that this snobbery and the, the looking down on somebody – uh, listen, Philadelphia is an animal really unto itself. Uh, if you think that, that you can go into Philadelphia and do something that is not reciprocated, and, and by that what I mean is if you think you're going to go there and sell drugs and not kick back, you're going you're gonna to get your fucking head cracked. You're not going to be able – you can't just go there and do what you fucking want. It's an old – somebody once said to me, he goes, you know, Philadelphia is like an old world enclave. It hasn't changed – uh, maybe some of the players have changed, but the mentality is still there, and that's what that's what the key is. People people outside of Philadelphia uh, who don't know anybody in Philly never never hung out in Philly, never spent time. I have spent years in Philadelphia. This is nothing new to me. I love the pulse of the city. I always have. I always have. Uh, I have family in Philly, so I you know I have I have roots there, so to speak. I'm not from there, but I have roots there. Uh, but. One of the things that I think the biggest misconception about Philly, the biggest one, is that your George Anastasias of the fucking world, your Ratweisers, always make it out to seem like everybody's telling on everybody there, and that's not the fucking case. That is one of the strongest foundations I have ever fucking seen in my life in organized crime. One of the strongest. You know, and I've used this reference before. If you take the Lucchese's, the Lucchese's have seven active crews, okay? Seven active crews. That's seven captains. God knows how many fucking associates. God knows how many fucking soldiers. That gives you a big perspective of the difference in just the numbers. But the problem is some guys don't know certain guys. So, well, as you take Philly, and this is by no means valid or, or accurate, but let's say Philly had 40 guys. All 40 of them guys, 35 of them grew up together. They've been playing with each other in the fucking playpen since they wore diapers. They know one another. 
They know one another. It's always a fucking outsider piece of shit that fucking runs their mouth and gets everybody caught up in a fucking charge. Yet, in comparison to the Lucchese's, you got seven fucking crews. The veracity or the, the odds or the opportunity for a rat to dismantle seven fucking crews happens like that. When you know somebody your whole fucking life, you know that you know the way that they behave. You've seen them keep their mouth shut before. You've seen them do whatever they had to do to keep everybody else out of prison. You can't crack that. And you, you, your Ranastasias and your Ratweisers are going to continue to fucking pound that fucking gavel saying, oh, an indictment's coming. Everybody's going down. And they can continue to say the same bullshit because they have nothing else to talk about. If they had anything else to talk about, they would be talking about. They mentioned Dom Grande every fucking day. Why? What's the fucking point? To my knowledge, nobody has proven that Dom Grande was caught on any tapes. Well, according to associates or, or according to what we hear, guys are saying it's... Guys say a lot of fucking shit. But show me some fucking proof. They're so busy... I don't know, God, I didn't want to get started on this shit today. But the point is, is what I'm saying to you is... You cannot crack a foundation that is built in friendship. You can't. You can't. You just can't. You know, and, and I'm going to say this too. You know, one of the things that, that I've experienced in my life is you've got two sides of the coin with things. Uh, I've met a lot of mob guys in my life, and some are very affectionate. Some guys are absolute fucking demonic fucking people who don't look at you. They look fucking through you. They don't make eye contact. They're like looking past your eyeballs into your fucking out your asshole, looking at your soul. There's a specific look. And if you've ever seen it, you understand it. But the thing I can say about Philly is that it, it's family oriented. It, it's always been that way. Guys give a shit about each other. They give a shit about their kids and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, so if you're looking for a model of what old school Cosa Nostra is, it's Philadelphia. And people are going to disagree with me. And I really don't give a fuck what anybody's opinion is. That's just what I get. Uh, and I marvel at the respect. I marvel at the friendship. I marvel at the honesty. I marvel at the loyalty. People will tell you there's no loyalty in Philly, but that's bullshit. Trust me. Uh, and loyalty is a dying thing. It's a dying thing. All right. There are so many rumors in Philadelphia today. Uh, how can you assimilate gossip from actual facts? First of all, I don't believe anything that George Anastasia or Dave Ratweiser says. That's number one. Number two, anytime they say sources are saying, one, they made it up, or two, they got it from one or two other people, uh, and it's, 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 it's not valid. It's not valid. Uh, three, Philadelphia is always going to be talked about, uh, I think, because the FBI has never been able to totally dismantle them. So they're always going to talk about it. They're always going to talk about it. But I, I think the reality is is there's always going to be rumors in Philly uh, just because of the small nature of Philly. Uh, and, you know, people people want to create headlines there. They always have, uh, you know. And so that there it is. All right, Tommy, Pater Tommy Patera can't paint anymore in prison. Why is that? I don't think he ever could paint in prison. I think it's pencil drawings uh, and markers and et cetera. I don't know what the specific rule is of prisons with paint, but I, I would imagine there's a good reason why they don't allow paint. But I know he's still drawing and doing other stuff like that. He is selling it, TommyPateraArt.com. All right, last one. Is this the last one? All right, last one. Phil Narducci's sentencing is coming up, uh, and I know his deal was for one year and one day. Can you explain why he even pled out, uh, and can the judge give him more time? Also, if his, if his sentence is for one year and one day with him already in, how much time will he actually do? Okay, so, you know what? Hold on. I'm going to do something that I probably shouldn't do. Hold on. Rather than, you know, sit here and uh, just, I I'm going to read you something that I got from Phil, actually, and I'll, I'll let you decide uh, what the answer is. Because I could sit here and I could tell you, look, the guy's a terrorist, he's a liar. It, 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 listen, at the bottom, end of the day, uh, if a judge isn't going to allow testimony that the informant in the case is a terrorist and he's done some horrible shit, then how can you absolutely defend yourself? Because now you've it, it's it's prejudicial in in, in as, as far as I'm concerned. So let me just let me read this from this is directly from Phil. On September 10th, I'm going to be sentenced to a year and a day, basically with the 15 percent deduction and the new First Step Act. It literally makes my sentence nine months and two weeks. I actually had my attorney come up and see me yesterday. I spoke with my case manager here and was told because of the fact 
that by the time I get to sentencing, I'll have five months in, that we are going to ask the judge to order home confinement and make it a part of my sentencing. However, uh, there isn't going to be enough time uh, for him to be processed really to a halfway house or home confinement or be moved to a prison because there's not any time left. So therefore, that's why he's making the argument that, that he wants to argue for final home confinement for whatever time he's got remaining. I would definitely rather be sitting in the luxury of my own home than be in this place. I believe this judge may do it because I already was on home confinement and had no problems. Plus the fact that I pled guilty and accepted responsibility and successfully completed home confinement and self-surrendered to the U.S. Marshals. Uh, that's also a reason uh, – that should be a reason to exclude me from any type of risks. They wanted to – uh, make me sign three years of supervised release, but I refuse to do that. But naturally, that'll be another fight in court. Um, I'm going to definitely uh, discuss the a AUSA and the FBI agent uh, and blow them out of the water for all they did to indict me on such a bullshit case. Uh, if I did not have to worry about my and, – and this is the part I want you to hone in on. If I did not have to worry about my past case coming up, having the jury fucking Google me – uh, I would have went to trial in a heartbeat, but because of that chance, I could not roll the dice. With these feds, you have to plead guilty if you are even even if you are 100% innocent, because that's how stacked the stacked the cards are against you. We actually had the best judge that you could possibly ask to get. Uh, the thing that I was really not happy about was the fact that the judge said we could not tell the jury about this scumbag being a terrorist. I was a little shocked by this ruling because once you take the stand, you're basically an open book. So for all the people who said, if I was innocent, why did I plead guilty? This is the reason. I would rather do six months in prison than 70 months in prison for something I didn't do. So there you go. From the lips of Phil Narducci. So... I hope that answers that question. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to talk about former uh, Kansas City boss, Charlie Bonaggio. Stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio. Welcome back to Mob Talk Radio, and we are going to be talking about uh, Charlie Bonaggio. And, and the reason why we're talking about him is because he's a lesser-known figure in organized crime in Kansas City, uh, and he had a fairly uh, long run. Uh, but more importantly, I'm sort of gearing towards uh, talking about JFK in the next couple weeks, and, and I really want to hone in on guys who use the political system to their gain. Uh, we've always talked about on this show that without politics, without owning politicians, uh, things are very difficult. Obviously, we look at Sam Giancana, and he was very, very good back in the day at controlling politics. And, uh, you know, Charlie uh, Bonaggio was sort of cut from the same cloth. Uh, this isn't going to be a huge biography, but I think there's going to be some things that are, are very interesting. All right, Charles. Uh, Bonaggio was born in Beaumont, Texas on January 12th of 1909, and pretty much as a child, they, his family ended up uprooting and going to Kansas City, uh, Missouri. Bonaggio would grow up on the north side, uh, which at the time was an Italian enclave, specifically Sicilians. Uh, but there isn't much known about how Bonaggio really gets into the life. However, once he did, he pretty much rose in the ranks fairly quickly. On December of 1930 in Denver, Colorado, uh, Benaggio would be arrested for firearms charges. It was three separate firearms charges. 
Uh, he was actually at the time in an apartment with Anthony Gizzo and Tony uh, Casciola, who were both well-known uh, Casciola, who were both well-known Kansas City mobsters at the time. They, like I said, they would be charged with three separate weapons violations, but charges would eventually be reduced to vagrancy, and Benaggio would be released on bond. Uh, to take a charge like weapons charges and having them dro- drop to vagrancy, somebody has to get paid for that. You just don't go from weapons, federal weapons charges, or even state weapons charges to vagrancy. Uh, it, it's just a little circumspect, but it is what it is, and it's not the first time this is going to happen to this guy either. Uh, the reason for Benaggio being in Denver really was pretty much an auspicious one. Uh, Kansas City boss at the time, John Lazia, ended up sending a team down there to help out with the escalating war between the Roma crime family in Denver and the Carlino crime family, which was located in Pueblo, Colorado at the time. Uh, Denver was long a deep history of organized crime in Denver. Uh, we could actually do like a multiple show segment on Denver itself. But with multiple families, Benaggio would actually end up getting arrested again for vagrancy. Uh, but those charges, again, would disappear as well. Uh, Benaggio was a killer and an earner, making him very valuable to his boss, John Lazia. He ended up running a multi-million dollar bootlegging operation and ran a huge gambling ring. On July 20th of 1931, Benaggio would show his commitment to the mafia by killing a Bureau of Prohibition agent along with two others in a brazen shootout. This guy killed a Prohibition agent. Take some serious fucking moxie. Uh, He would later be arrested for that crime. However, the reason for the murder was basically that Prohibition agents along with local police were raiding different businesses, including the Noto Flower Shop, uh, which was really the headquarters for Joe Lusco, who was a capo in the Lazia crime family at the time. But the agents end up going in, they end up start busting open the fucking place, and as they come into the shop and they start trashing the fucking place, Bonaggio grabbed a gun and just starts fucking shooting. Uh, an agent and two others would be killed. He would end up getting arrested for that, taken downtown and questioned, but for some reason they couldn't corroborate him actually pulling the trigger, even though law enforcement suspected all along that he did it. Uh, and he would officially, again, be charged with vagrancy. Uh, this has got to be the only guy in the history of organized crime to be charged with vagrancy three fucking times, one after a gun charge, one after a murder, and one after something else. I, I, <laughs> I, vagrancy is a hell of a fucking charge. What would you do? I clipped three motherfuckers last week. What was your charge? Vagrancy. <laughs> So after the shootout at the Noto headquarters, uh, Lazia officially inducts Benaggio into the crime family and sort of begins to tutor him in the ways of being a street guy and in the ways of the crime family itself. Uh, Lazia had pretty much formed uh, a Democratic club on the north side, which enabled him to keep an eye on politics and enabled him to really have a big power base in Kansas City. So once again, we see politics being the root of power and strength in the Midwest. Uh, Maybe it's just a fucking Midwest thing. You know, who knows? Uh, But once again, like I said, we see the political theme here. Uh, When you control politics, you control everything from city hall down to the police, down to the fucking meter maids. That's just how it operates. Uh, One of the things Benaggio would learn from Lazio is how to control the police. Uh, And for the next 20 years plus, he controlled the state police, the local police, and the political machine until his death. But it was ultimately that wanton control over police departments, which was going to lead to his downfall and death, as we're going to see here shortly. In 1934, Lazio would get whacked, uh, and the official underboss, Charlie DeWap Corallo, would end up taking over. Many suspected that Corallo was behind the hit. As Corallo ends up taking over, he promotes Bonaggio to underboss. Uh, so if it's true that Corallo was really behind the hit, it doesn't really take too much rocket science to, to see that, that the Bonaggio probably was involved because there there was more for him to gain by by getting involved in that than, than sort of uh, throwing caution to the wind and creating a war. In 1939, Corallo was uh, making waves, uh, and the state was looking to rid itself of organized crime, but couldn't get Corallo on anything but tax evasion. So once again, we see this tax evasion thing. I don't know why. I'm not Listen, I'm not defending the fucking federal government here, but I don't know why they don't use that. Uh, to their advantage more. It, it seems like they, they look for the big fucking crimes. Meanwhile, Capone, Luciano, all these other guys get income tax charges. Once again, we see here Corallo gets income tax charges, uh, and he ends up getting sent to prison. And that pretty much cleared the way for Bonaggio to end up taking over. Uh, and he would become the official noted boss in October of 1939. 
Uh, Kansas City was always a volatile crime family with zero compunction about murder and mayhem. They were incredibly violent, even from their early days. Uh, they wouldn't hesitate for a second. The violent side to the mafia in Kansas City went all the way back to its roots. Uh, it went back to the Black Hand, uh, which was an early version of Cosa Nostra, which actually controlled the north side. The Black Hand, like I said, was the early early version of the mafia. It was also known as Mano Nera, uh, and it was named really for the ex- extension of the extortion racket or the criminal crimes themselves. Uh, so the Black Hand, whereas it became known as a criminal organization... Really, it started as just a moniker for the extension of the crimes that they would commit. Uh, The Black Hand, uh, just so you know, you can trace those roots all the way back to Naples as early as the late 1700s. Uh, but they really wouldn't show their face into the United States until about 18, the late, mid, mid 1880s. Uh, it was the 1900s where the Black Hand in America first really begins to dig its heels in. New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, New Orleans, Scranton, San Francisco, and Olan, New York, and Detroit all had subsidiaries of the Black Hand. That's really where the mob gets its start. Uh, in 1907, the headquarters of the Black Hand was located in Hillsville, Pennsylvania, and they'd established, believe it or not, a school for mobsters to train them in the art of using a fucking stiletto switchblade. If you can believe that. Uh, Census reports from that time period say that 90% of all Italian workmen and immigrants were shaken down by by the Black Hand in those days. Typical crimes of the Black Hand was murder, kidnapping, extortion. But really what their thing was was kidnapping and extortion. Uh, Famous crimmer Enrico Caruso was even a victim of the Black Hand. Uh, and he actually ended up paying because he was afraid of them. But ultimately he would end up turning a rat. Uh, and and telling law enforcement authorities after multiple subsidiary groups, the Black Hand tried to do the same thing. He wasn't going to pay 12 grand more than once, uh, but he ended up running to the police and blah, 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 blah. All right, so in November of 1941, Benaggio is speeding down the street near his apartment when he runs over a 50-year-old man who was trying to cross the street. He essentially didn't even stop. He just mowed him over. Uh, He would be arrested and charged with manslaughter, but the jury would refuse to indict him. Following that incident, Bonaggio would travel with his driver, Nick Penna, for almost the rest of his life. Uh, Probably more so to have a witness, (laughs) more than anything. Uh, Bonaggio continued to bring in tons of cash to the family, even his boss. So in a lot of families, we see how bosses kind of stop pilfering and, and stop trying to go out and earn a ton of money. They sit back and just collect. Not this guy. This guy just kept going out and trying to earn money. Uh, He would continue to keep a stranglehold on gambling and liquor and would use those profits to venture into narcotics. Uh, The narcotics ring included Kansas City, Tampa, St. Louis, Montreal, and Michigan. Uh, It was insanely lucrative, but Bonaggio was smart enough to keep himself directly out of the meetings. He would never put his hands on any drugs, and he would never put himself in any place where drugs were located. When the Bureau of Narcotics eventually comes in and they begin to arrest everybody, uh, Bonaggio was able to escape being linked to anybody. The problem for Bonaggio, though, uh, was that one of his captains, Joe DeLuca, would end up getting sent to prison and another low-level, me- uh, who, who at the time was a low-level, uh, excuse me, Joe DeLuca, Joe DeLuca was a capo. Uh, he would end up becoming a rat. Then a low-level player in the drug trafficking ring also would rat, his name, uh, Carl Caramusa. In 1945, Caramusa would get whacked for his discretion uh, Caramusa fled and went to Chicago, but ultimately was found, and they shot him a dozen times and left him on the street for being a rat. Uh, nothing really ever came uh, Bonaggio's way of that narcotics ring. He was able to kind of escape it. In the early 40s, Bonaggio turned his direction his direction towards politics, and this is where he makes somewhat of a bad mistake. Uh, Bonaggio knew that holding on to a firm grip into politics would enable him and his family to keep moving forward. You control the politics, you control the cops. Control the cops, control City Hall, etc., etc. Uh, he would even form his own political club, sort of taking uh, his cue from Lazia, uh, and he called it the First Ward Democratic Club and would begin to overtake wards in and around the north side. Uh, he wanted the north side to really be on complete lockdown. At these club, local politicians... Uh, and cops would be paid off monthly to sort of look the other way and to do favors. The problem was uh, that he drew the ire of a uh, guy by the name of Jim Pendergast. Uh, He was the former nephew of the Kansas City political boss, Tom Pendergast. Uh, Bonaggio was basically trying to back his candidate for Missouri governor, and Pendergast really didn't agree with that, and so Pendergast decided he would back a side and they would go to political war. 
1944, uh, Benagio's first candidate gets defeated in a landslide in the primary election by Pendergast candidate. In 1948, Bonaggio was successful. He would back the Democratic nominee Forrest Smith and would use the mob's connections to make sure that Smith won the election. Uh, Bonaggio basically had gone to the commission in New York and arranged for a loan of $2 million for Smith's election campaign. Chicago was in on it. The New York commission was in on it. It worked out great. Uh, the promise was is that if Smith won, he would be promised basically he would allow legal, legitimate gambling in Missouri, which was a fair trade off for the mafia at the time. Bonaggio ends up traveling to meet Charlie Fischetti, who hands Bonaggio the money in a suitcase. During this period, Kansas City was under the thumb of Chicago, at least in terms of mafia hierarchy. Uh, using the money and the power, Bonaggio ends up getting Smith elected in a sweeping victory, but it was also going to be his fucking undoing. The 1948 election, this is also very important, also brought Harry Truman back to the White House. Bonaggio was also involved in getting votes for fucking Harry Truman. Truman needed mob-backed votes, and he got them, and that's why he got elected to the White House. A lot of people never talk about that. Uh, to celebrate the huge victory, because Bonaggio helped out using the political machine in Chicago and other states, he ends up chartering a private train because he wants to go to the inauguration. But Truman finds out that he wants to come, and Truman basically shits all over him and then backs Pendergast uh, as sort of a, a slap in the face. Truman needed the help of the Chicago machine. They got it through Bonaggio, and now he shits on him. Where have we seen this before? JFK, anybody? Same exact thing. So it was Bonaggio's direct work that got Truman elected, and once again we see D D.C. politicians turning their backs after the mob put them in place. With Smith elected, Bonaggio really thought everything was just going to be fine. However, there are some problems that sort of begin. Uh, Bonaggio had a, stra a strategy. The strategy was take control of the St. Louis and Kansas City's police departments outright. He had always had guys on the take, but he wanted to fill control with no pushback. Uh, he knew that if he controlled both departments, gambling would be completely safe from government and uh, from police as well. In the late 1930s, both departments had been controlled by the state after widespread corruption uh, within the ranks. Both departments were ruled by a separate board of police commissioners that were appointed by the government. So you can see why he wanted Smith in so bad. Uh, if he could control the governor, he thought he could get the candidates of his choosing appointed to the police boards, which would make owning a le legitimate gambling establishments totally legal. Uh, and with Smith getting elected, it looked like everything was going to go as to plan. However, Smith goes back on his word. Uh, initially, he let Bonaggio make adjustments to the police boards, but then pretty much refused outright to allow Bonaggio to put anybody of his choosing in. Bonaggio would then be denied the majority decisions on both boards, which basically crippled Bonaggio. Uh, it, it basically rendered him unable to control the police in Kansas City and St. Louis, and as a result, the mob was going to lose all their gambling stuff. It was just never going to happen. Basically, Smith fucked him. Uh, as a result, Chicago was fucking furious, as was New York. Not only did they give this guy $2 million, but he said he had a sure way to get fucking gambling into the city. Turns out he was wrong. Uh, Smith fucked him. And basically what ended up happening was he gets called uh, to a meeting, and he's told, you either fix this shit or else it's the gun. Uh, Benaggio takes the threat seriously, and he does everything he possibly can. He even tries to, to bribe a Kansas City commissioner. Uh, he would threaten to beat up people, threaten to chop people in half, but they laughed at him, and they laughed at him because they had the Governor Smith on their side. So Smith used Benaggio to get elected, then turn around and basically said, fuck you to Benaggio, what are you going to do? He's the governor. You can't really clip a governor. I mean, they probably should have, uh, but they didn't. And that created a big, big, big problem because now Benaggio's done everything he can. He owes the, the, the commission $2 million. They're not going to get that back. They're not going to get their gambling back. So just, the, the commission has a decision to make, and they end up voting. On April 5th of 1950, Benaggio and his underboss at the time, Charlie Gargata, get called to a meeting. The first meeting, uh, or the meeting rather, was at the First Ward Democratic Club near downtown. Bonaggio dropped off his driver, Nick Pennant, at the bar, which he never did, uh, which leads many to believe that he sort of had a premonition of what was going to happen. Uh, Bonaggio and Gargata borrowed a car. They drive over to the club. Sometime around after 8 p.m., people living above the club hear multiple gunshots. A local uh, shop owner noticed that the front door 
was opened, and they ended up calling the to the club, and they ended up calling the police. As the police entered, they found uh, the bodies of Gargata and Bonaggio. Bonaggio was sitting at a desk with six shots to his head and face, and Gargata was laying on the floor with multiple shots. According to the police, it looked like Gargata had tried to run out of the club uh, when he got shot in the back of his head multiple times. Uh, speculation has always been that St. Louis used their mob guys to do it. Uh, others have said it was done by Chicago, but I happen to believe the order came from New York to Chicago, but I would hedge my money on the hit being done from within side the family itself. Uh, likely the hit was organized by Anthony Gizzo, uh, and likely his reward for taking, excuse me, taking out Benaggio was to be given the title of boss of Kansas City. Uh, and so, you know, whereas Bonaggio may not have uh, the world's longest biography, the reason why I wanted to do this was to show you how the political machine works, how politics work within the mob. A uh, good example, we've seen how Kennedy used the mob to get elected. He couldn't have done it without the mafia. This is why Joe Kennedy goes to Frank Sinatra to enlist the help of Hollywood. Uh, the liberals. They were afraid they wouldn't get the liberals. They ended up getting the liberals. Then they had they needed Chicago because they felt like a Irish Catholic, uh, specifically uh, in West Virginia, couldn't get elected. Uh, there's a lot of hatred for Catholics in those days, and so they needed Chicago to sort of manipulate West Virginia. In fact, I can tell you from uh, personal knowledge, I knew somebody whose grandfather. Uh, sort of ran the political operation for the mob in West Virginia. And what he told me years and years, we're talking 20 years ago before he died, is that anytime somebody came in to vote, they were told that the machine was malfunctioned and that if you were voting for Kennedy, you had to do it twice. What people didn't realize was for every one person, Kennedy was getting two votes. And that's how Chicago mafia, that's how West Virginia mob, that's how, all, that's how the mob controlled now, people are going to call bullshit, but it's true. Uh, but that's how the mob controlled. That's how they controlled the po the political machine. That's how Kennedy gets elected. Kennedy would have had a very hard time in the Deep South being Catholic, getting elected. And he would have had a hard time uh, in West Virginia in, in places like that that were typically Baptist. Uh, now, it is true that you know Kennedy on his own gets the nomination, but it wouldn't have been enough. It wouldn't have been enough. He needed the mob's power to get the backing of the votes and the money, and that's what he got. He got the Teamsters pension fund. He got everything else. So the mob put him in charge, and the end result is the same thing we see in this situation with Benaggio. Uh, it, 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 it's the same situation. They put guys in power because they think they're going to get a kickback, and the guys fuck them in the ass. You know That's why Kennedy was killed. That's why Bobby Kennedy was killed. Why Smith, uh, Forrest Smith in this case wasn't killed is beyond me, but this is going to be a reoccurring theme for the next couple of shows because we're going to talk about the Kennedy thing, which is probably going to be three or four shows, three or four parts, uh, and we're going to discuss like how the, the political machine works, uh, the, the the vote rigging, uh, how dead people voted in the fucking Kennedy administration, the cover-ups from all different angles. Uh, it's just not a conspiracy theory. Uh, usually what passes the smell test for me, conspiracy theory-wise, is if there's too many dots that connect, and in the Kennedy case, there is. So... All that being said, here's what you guys can look forward to. First of all, follow us on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. Submit your questions there. Follow us, retweet us, do your thing. Go over to Facebook, type in the Flanagan's TV show. Give us a like, give us a follow. That's where you can get all your casting news. And I believe that that stuff's probably going to start making news about Monday or Tuesday of next week. We are going to take a week off from Mob Talk Radio. When we come back, we are going to get into the JFK thing uh, along with Huey Long and some other political type of stuff uh, as well. We do have a donate button on YouTube. Now, let me explain this. If you go to about, you click about, you go down, you'll see in text it says donate. Click the donate button if you want to donate. You want to donate 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. Every little bit helps. It enables me to keep the show free. It enables me to keep the show free. It, it allows me to do some other things that we want to do. It, by no means necessary do I got a gun to your head about anything. Uh, there have been a lot of people that have donated $1, $2, $5, $10. And every single little bit of this goes right back into the show, allows me to buy uh, stuff, updates for my computer, and allows me to, to buy new mics. And, and it allows me to travel, believe it or not, to go interview some people, uh, which 
we will make an announcement uh, probably in the next month or so about some guests that we're going to have. You're not going to believe the people I got, but it allows me to travel. Uh, the more I keep pulling out of my pocket, the harder it gets. So while I can appreciate those who don't want to donate, you are entitled to, to not donate. Uh, but to those who have, I really wanted to say thank you because uh, without you, I, first of all, without people listening, the show wouldn't be anything anyway. Uh, but those who have, have taken the time to like throw a dollar, throw two dollars, throw five dollars, throw ten dollars, uh, you mean the world to me because that just enables me to continue doing the show for free. And that's ultimately one of what, what I really want to do at the end of the day. I don't want to charge you guys for this. I, I want to just continue to do this. And, and if I can make enough just to pay for some of the travel and, and some of the guests and, and the dinner meetings I got to go to to try to schmooze them to get them on, then, then that's what I want to do. So if you think that. Uh, the, the, the money's going towards a crack habit or something like that. that That's not the case. I throw it right back into the show. So all that being said, check out the Flanagan's TV show on Facebook. Give it a like. Share it. Please share it. Uh, look for the casting calls coming up. Uh, check us out on Mob Talk Radio on Facebook. Donate if you can, please. Uh, also, we have Mob Talk art for sale and merchandise. Don't forget about that. Uh, we're going to be doing another sale here shortly. And two, if you if you private message me and and you know, listen, I'm not a hard ass fuck. I'll, I'll negotiate with anybody. I, I'm not trying to get rich off that. I, as a matter of fact, I don't get rich off that anyway. Uh, but if you're interested in Mob Talk art, uh, send me a message. Uh, but I'm going to provide all the links in the show today. So, all that being said, I'm taking off for a week. It's my birthday on the 17th. So. Everybody have a great week and a half, whatever the fuck it's going to be. And uh, we'll be back with all new topics, all new Q&As and everything. And once again, I really appreciate everybody donating who have. I appreciate those who will donate. And I really appreciate uh, everybody taking time out of their day to submit questions. I wish I could get to all of you. I just, I just can't, but I'm going to do my best. So with that, I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see everybody in a week and a half.